Namaskaram. In this video, I shall be sharing the recent most update on the diagnosis and management of Kawasaki disease in children. It has been given the year 2024 as a scientific statement made by the American Heart Association and is very important for your examinations as well as from a practical point of view. It continues to be a clinical diagnosis without a definite pathognomic test. Complete Kawasaki disease should have two main things. First thing is that there should be fever for at least for four days and the day of fever onset should be counted as day one. And four out of these five clinical parameters. And what are these five clinical parameters? Polymorphous rash, I shall be showing the demonstrate the pictures of the same in the ensuing scene. Polymorphous rash, bilateral conjunctival injection without exudate, orocutaneous changes which can be in the form of erythema and cracking of lips, strawberry tongue, erythema of oral and pharyngeal mucosa or all, palmer and plantar erythema usually accompanied by swelling which resolves with subsequent periangual desquamation in the subacute phase. Cervical adenopathy which is usually unilateral and cluster of lymph nodes should be more than equal to 1.5 cm in diameter. And the last thing is that the illness should not be explained by known alternative disease process. What is important to remember is that these clinical features can occur at any point during the illness and they not essentially it, they, it is not essential that they occur in the same in this concurrent fashion only. Suspected or incomplete Kawasaki disease is again prolonged unexplained fever and two to three of the five clinical features which we had mentioned earlier or infants with unexplained fever lasting for more than equal to seven days along with compatible lab and echo findings that is CRP more than equal to three milligrams per deciliter or ESR more than equal to four millimeters per hour or both of them and more than equal to three of the following things. First is anemia for age, platelets that is thrombocytosis more than equal to 4.5 lakh per cubic millimeter, serum albumin that is less than equal to 3 grams per deciliter, elevated alanine transferase, TLC more than equal to 15,000 per cubic millimeter, urine WBC is more than equal to 10 per high power field and Z score of left anterior descending coronary artery or right coronary artery more than equal to 2.5 more than or equal to 2.5 on the bed, uh, baseline or more than equal to 3 by 4 suggestive features that is decreased left ventricular function, mitral regurgitation, pericardial effusion or Z score in LAD or RCA between 2 to 2.5. These are the photographs of the clinical findings I had just mentioned. First is conjunctival injection without exudate. Next is typical strawberry tongue. Then the polymorphous rash palmar erythema with edema, plantar erythema with edema, periangual desquamation in the subacute phase and the polymorphous rash. One must remember to add MISC that is multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children associated with COVID-19 always to the differential diagnosis of Kawasaki disease even though the prevalence of this condition has decreased markedly since the year 2022 ever since the incidence of COVID came down. I have made two videos on MISC earlier during the COVID times. First is a detailed video on MISC and second is how to differentiate it from the closed differential diagnosis in which I have discussed about Kawasaki disease also. I shall be sharing the link of the same in the description box below. Once you suspect Kawasaki disease clinically, then you perform the initial lab evaluation which includes complete blood count with manual differential leukocyte count, ESR, CRP, total bilirubin, ALT, GGT, our renal function test and electrolytes, urine microscopy and cardiac evaluation which includes ECG and ECO. After lab evaluation, if, the, if you find the patient fulfills the criteria for complete Kawasaki disease, then you treat with the first line of management which includes IV, IG and aspirin and assess for the high risk features. These high risk features include age less than equal to 6 months and left anterior descending or right coronary artery Z score more than equal to 2.5 on baseline echo at the initial evaluation itself. So if these high risk features are present, then in that case you have to intensify the first line of treatment. I shall be talking in detail what does this mean. Regular clinical and lab monitoring needs to be done 
and repeat echocardiogram every 2 to 3 days or as per the cardiologist's opinion and manage the evolving coronary arteries. Evolving coronary arteries, we know that the most dreaded complication of Kawasaki disease is the development of coronary artery aneurysm. So this is what is meant by evolving coronary arteries. Coronary arteries, if affected, they can develop aneurysm. If high risk features are not present, then in that case, you re-evaluate the patient at 36 hours after completion of the first dose of IVIG and proceed as accordingly. If after lab evaluation, you find that the patient fulfills the criteria for incomplete Kawasaki disease, then you have to decide whether you want to treat the patient or not. In case you have decided to treat the patient, you must again give the first line treatment that is IVIG and aspirin and assess for the higher risk features. In case no, you must re-evaluate if fever persists. If there is fever, again you intensify the first line of treatment, do regular clinical lab monitoring and repeat echo every 2-3 to three days and manage the evolving coronary arteries. In case fever is not present, then in that case you can discharge the patient to home, transit to low dose aspirin, give no live vaccination for 11 months post IVIG, cardiology follow up should be done within 7-14 to 14 days or sooner if higher risk is present and you must give the patient education on Kawasaki disease that is the patient should review or return urgently if fever or any other symptoms of Kawasaki disease reappear. There are different phases of therapy and this is something new which has come up in these in this scientific statement or in this update which I want to stress upon as well. The initial therapy as we saw in the previous scene itself was IVIG and aspirin. Another thing is intensification of therapy. Intensification of therapy is done in three conditions. First is if there is IVIG resistance which is defined as persistent or recrudescent fever more than equal to 36 hours after completion of the initial IVIG infusion. Or the another indication is high risk patients which we had already seen as age less than equal to 6 months and left anterior descending or right coronary artery Z score being more than equal to 2.5 on the baseline echo. Or the third parameter is Kawasaki disease shock. It is Kawasaki disease presenting with signs of low blood pressure, low perfusion or myocardial dysfunction. More commonly presenting with elevated CRP, hypoalbuminemia and thrombocytopenia compared with Kawasaki disease without shock. Hemodynamic instability generally improves quickly once IVIG therapy has been administered and it should be considered for intensification of initial therapy as we are talking here. Intensification of therapy means adding on to or giving a dose of prednisolone, methylprednisolone, infliximab or etanercept. And additional therapy for refractory disease also includes cyclosporine, anakinera, second dose of intravenous immunoglobulin and cyclophosphamide. Additional therapy for coronary artery aneurysm in case that has developed includes statins and anticoagulation which you must start with on after consultation with the cardiologist. This is the drug list which has been recommended by AHA. For initial therapy we are using IV, IG and aspirin. The doses have been mentioned here. IVIG 2 gram per kg over 8 to 12 hours and aspirin 30 to 50 mg per kg uh, per day divided every 6 hours. 30 to 50 mg per kg per day. That is, that is a very high dose and it is basically the anti-inflammatory dose. Later on, you continue with 3 to 5 mg per kg per day only and this is the anti-thrombotic dose. For intensification, you consider prednisolone, methylprednisolone, infliximab which is a monoclonal antibody against TNF-alpha and etanercept which is a soluble receptor that binds TNF-alpha and TNF-beta. Additional therapy for refractory disease includes cyclosporin, anakinera which is recombinant interleukin 1b receptor antagonist, a second dose of intravenous immunoglobulin and cyclophosphamide. The risk of myocardial infarction in patients with Kawasaki disease with coronary artery aneurysm is highest in the first 2-3 to three months of Kawasaki disease onset and that is why even if you discharge a patient of Kawasaki disease successfully, you must keep them in close follow-up for at least 2-3 to three months in your follow-up as well as in the follow-up of the cardiologist. Acute coronary symptoms may present differently in patients with KD compared with classic presentation of MI in adults with atherosclerosis 
and centers that follow patients with kawasaki disease with giant coronary artery aneurysm need to have a multidisciplinary cardiac team and a protocol in place to address the major cardiac adverse events you suspect a cardiac event or symptoms in an infant or a child if they have non specific poorly localized pain unexplained crying restlessness unusual pallor and sweating and in an older children and adolescents if they have chest arm or abdominal pain which may even be absent breathlessness vomiting skin discoloration in either case you go for laboratory evaluation or primary assessment do a blood biochemistry coagulation profile troponin chest x ray and ecg and give oxygen aspirin morphine that is primary management morphine in case if chest pain is severe and urgent cardiology consultation in case you identify the patient as having st elevation myocardial infarction on ecg and the time to cath lab is less than 90 minutes then you immediately transfer the patient to cath lab for percutaneous in, in intervention and if the coronary flow is restored then you can consider the patient for post therapy considerations which includes starting clopidogrel eptifibatide continuing aspirin starting beta blocker statin and ace inhibitor within 24 hours and if non occluding thrombosis diagnosed reevaluate your anticoagulation protocol in case st elevation non st elevation acute cardiac syndrome is present then you have to start heparin do serial troponin ecg and urgent imaging with coronary ct angiography and in case thrombosis is present you do percutaneous intervention or thrombolysis and in case it is stenosis is present you do percutaneous intervention or coronary artery bypass graft if necessary this is the thrombolysis protocol which i had been talking about in the previous scene echocardiography remains the primary non invasive imaging modality for assessing the patients with coronary artery aneurysms in and is very crucial in patients with kawasaki disease and one must use the same z score equation for comparison over time in patients with kawasaki disease using because using different z scores will change the ca coronary artery risk classification and obtaining accurate weight and height can prevent over or underestimation of coronary artery z scores these are the eco standards which have been given by the aha and one can click a snapshot of the scene in case you want you are a cardiologist and you want to know that it in detail intensification of primary therapy with adjunctive anti inflammatory therapy that is dual therapy may benefit high risk patients with kawasaki disease who are more prone to developing coronary artery aneurysms patient with large coronary artery aneurysms require anti platelet and anti coagulation therapy both which is referred to as dual therapy new dao acs that is direct oral anticoagulants are not as affected by vitamin k intake as warfarin and do not require therapeutic monitoring challenges of warfarin or low molecular weight heparin and they are the, these things are the new in the market and need to be researched further for use doacs or direct oral anticoagulants may also provide a more convenient and safer alternative than warfarin and lmwh because they lack the challenges of monitoring and uh, they are not affected by vitamin k intake future studies are needed to establish the safety and efficacy of doac therapy in patients with kawasaki disease if echo at diagnosis or later in illness shows coronary artery aneurysm you must first classify whether this coronary artery aneurysm is small that is z score is more than equal to 2.5 to less than 5 in which case you classify the patient as having is b as being in risk level 3 whether it is a medium sized aneurysm that is z score more than equal to 5 to less than 10 and absolute dimensions less than 8 mm in which case you classify as risk level 4 or whether the aneurysm is large and giant that is z score more than equal to 10 or absolute dimensions more than equal to 8 in which case you classify as risk level 5 in either of these case you would like to add additional anti inflammatory therapy and repeat echo every 2 to 3 days until the coronary artery dimensions are stabilized in patients with small aneurysm you start with single anti platelet therapy and this will be aspirin low dose in patients with medium aneurysm you will start with dual anti platelet therapy which includes both aspirin and plus minus clopidogrel and in patients with large and giant aneurysm you will start dual anti platelet therapy along with anticoagulation 
you must also consider adding beta blockers in these patients to decrease the cardiac oxygen demand and consider transfusion if the patient is anemic. In either case, you will have to see if the patient is afebrile for more than 36 hours and coronary artery aneurysm is improving or the dimensions are stable for at least two times on successive echoes. In that case, you can consider the patient for discharge. In patients with large aneurysms, you need to do echo weekly once weekly for at least for the first 45 days that is one and a half months until the coronary artery aneurysm has modeled to moderate or small size and after it has modeled to moderate to small size and in patients with moderate to small size echo you perform echo monthly until the third month after the onset of illness because from the onset of illness three months after the onset of illness is the time duration when maximum number of aneurysms occur you must also educate the symptoms about symptoms of myocard uh, educate the patient about symptoms of myocardial infarction and the technique of cardiopulmonary resuscitation long term surveillance is necessary especially in those with large or giant aneurysms till at least 1 year after the onset of kawasaki disease which may be performed with low dose radiation coronary ct angiography mri with ferrimoxetol or invasive angiography depending on the patient's coronary complexity etc and CT, coronary CT angiography is done with, with less radiation can be used as a baseline to follow patients with CAA and to identify coronary artery stenosis. Coronary magnetic resonance imaging can help to evaluate patients without radiation, although it is better for myocardial function analysis in addition to stress perfusion imaging as a modality for inducible ischemia. Stress echocardiography can be used to evaluate patients with KD with coronary artery aneurysm for inducible ischemia. Invasive coronary angiography provides the finest delineation of the coronary architecture and medical care should establish healthcare transition plans as these children become adults. So we classify the risk level as from 1 to 5. Coronary arteries are not involved in risk level 1, they are only dilated in 2 and the aneurysm is small in 3, medium in 4 and large aneurysm in risk level 5. Z score values are less than 2, 2 to less than 5, less than 2.5, 2.5 to less than 5, 5 to less than 10 and more than equal to 10 respectively. Advanced imaging is not required in risk level 1 and 2 but CT angiography as a baseline is required from risk level 3 onwards. Antiplatelet therapy is single antiplatelet therapy can be given for risk level 1, 2, and 3, but for from risk level 4 and 5, you need to give dual antiplatelet therapy. And anticoagulation is not indicated in risk level 1, whereas you have to give it for high risk level that is risk level 5 with warfarin, low molecular weight heparin, or dual oral anticoagulants. Physical activity counseling is mandatory for all levels of risk. So thank you so very much for a very patient listening and watching. It's a complex topic, but yes, it is important for your examinations and for the successive examinations as more and more doctors are becoming aware of the fact that you must be abreast with the latest. Thank you so much and please do share your feedback in the comment section below. Thank you so much.